but also tremendously for the fall in the stock exchange, which will add another component to a possible economic crisis. Uh, the depth of this economic turn down, downturn, the impact on companies' finances, and the speed with which it's happened have caused that companies that were financially very healthy only a few weeks ago now have significant financial problems. Uh, and that in a country like the US. What will be crucial, uh, and, and that's the big unknown as yet, as to how long will this take and how quickly or not will be an economic recovery, uh, is how this economic recovery will be shaped. And expect a lot of analysts to start talking about a an, an, an V recovery, a U recovery, or an L-shaped recovery. A V-shaped uh, recovery means it went down very quickly and it goes up very, uh, very fast again. A U means it goes down very quickly and then it'll take quite some time to go back up. And an L, which is absolute the worst scenario, is it went down very quickly and stays at a bad level for a continued period of time. What is the US doing about that uh, at this moment? Uh, there's a stimulus package, and I haven't read the papers this morning yet, uh, this being discussed in the US Congress of about $2 trillion, which uh, will be applied to support companies and individuals to weather this crisis. The Me Mexico's economy, of course, is very dependent uh, and very exposed to the US economy. And as we all here say that if the US sneezes, we get pneumonia. Well, if the economists are right, the U.S. is about to get pneumonia. So we better brace ourselves for, uh, for some, some issues. The next one, please. Thomas, the next slide, please. We should be on the next slide now. Uh, Carol, do you see it? I see still the previous one. Oh, wait. No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah, there's one that... Uh, Maybe there's okay. some delay. Nope, got it. Okay, perfect. Uh, what can we expect from an economic financial point of view here in Mexico? And those of us who lived through the 2008-2009 crisis, uh, not to mention the, 90, the 95 crisis, uh, it'll sound quite familiar, the things that I'm, I'm going to mention now. Uh, the pressure on the economy will be very big. Uh, even though it's still too early to give any real predictions because we haven't really started yet with addressing the issues uh, caused by this virus. Uh, a deepening of the economic slowdown, we were already not growing and that will absolutely not change anytime soon. Uh, an increasing unemployment number, a significant reduction of exports and lower levels of, of remesas combined with higher inflation is quite likely. Uh, just as a reminder for the older ones among us, in 2009, Mexico's exports decreased by 20, uh, by 30%. And in 2009, 500,000 people lost their job. So uh, that's, that's what experience tells us uh, that may happen. There's another economic financial impact, the abrupt depreciation of the peso that went from 18 to 24, 25 uh, will affect the financial situation of importers of all sizes and companies that are heavily indebted in US dollars. Uh, bank credit, which as we all know is already scarce in Mexico, will become more scarce and even more expensive than it was. We will see a significant increase in companies that enter the concurso mercantil process, uh, but thousands of smaller companies especially will not even bother to go through this whole process and just disappear. In 2009, there were uh, around 12,000 small and medium-sized companies that just pulled the curtain down and stopped operating. If that isn't bad enough, the low, oil, the low oil prices that also got very much impacted between uh, lesser demand and an issue between Saudi Arabia and, and Russia will further impact the financial position of Pemex and therefore public finances. In every country, uh, Judith already alluded to that, I mentioned it, what they're talking about in the US, 
uh, government stimulus programs are the most certain and quick way to get back to an economic recovery and restore growth. Uh, my fear is that in Mexico, also given the current state of public finances, uh, this seems not to be an option at this moment. So when we are with, and this is, this is a slide just to, to show you a little bit, uh, an illustration of things that I, that I mentioned. These are newspaper clips uh, that we took on one single day from different papers. So it's not a collection of, uh, of the last month or so. This was just what showed up in one day and it's not very, very enticing. Now, the next one, please, Thomas, because what can we do uh, in our companies, especially, when we are faced with, with uh, so much uncertainty and these threats. And it's a couple of very practical tips that, that I would like to share with you. Uh, there's a golden rule in times of economic turmoil. Uh, there's really two. One is cash is king and cash management becomes crucial. Uh, if you can get, for example, your hands on additional cash, uh, do it. If you have, can you lay your hands on some additional credit facilities from banks and you can afford them because it doesn't make much sense to, to load up on credit card debt and pay 48% interest a year. But if you can, in a responsible way, uh, get your hands on cash, please do it. And the second golden rule I think uh, we've learned over the past is that a company's objectives sh objective should also be to still be a viable company after the crisis. Uh, and that would require defining certain priorities. Uh, there are opportunities also, no doubt, if you can uh, focus on export business to take advantage of the peso depreciation. Uh, try to look for new sources of revenue, sources that you have in the past uh, detected but not exploited. Uh, maybe this is a very good moment to see if you can uh, that way generate more, more cash. I would postpone non-critical investments and reduce expenses as much as possible without cutting into the bone. Remember, we still want to have a viable company after this crisis. And a very important uh, suggestion to keep this, this uh, to, to be able to do this, communicate with your suppliers. Uh, explain your difficulties, keep them informed at all times, don't give them surprises. If your bill is due to a supplier which you cannot pay, call him before, tell him what your problem is, and I guarantee you that almost all of your suppliers, uh, you'll find out, are your partners and will be your lifeline during and after a crisis like this one. So if necessary, coordinate a payment plan uh, with your supplier, and then pay them as you agree. Uh, the last thing you want is a supplier uh, where somebody who sits at the accounts receivables desk uh, and his boss walks in and said, what happened to the invoice from Carol van Laak from Mexico? And the guy says, you know, I have no idea. That's not the way to handle this. This man should be able to say, I spoke with him five times and three days ago he told me that he was, did not yet have the cash to pay us and he would like to talk to us about how we can refinance this. That's the way you use your suppliers. And from experience, we can tell that that's the way suppliers, uh, most of them, especially your core ones, are very happy to, uh, to, to behave. If you happen to have uh, issues with your supply chain because of this virus and you're sourcing product from, uh, from countries that are affected by this virus and you cannot get your raw materials, uh, Think about if you can get other products in there. Think about other locations where you can get it. And even think of other ways of transportation. If you used to bring in stuff by ship, uh, with everything that's happening, and especially in the transportation sector, uh, air freight has gotten very, very more, much more economical than it used to be before that. Another tip, uh, keep your credit standard high. Avoid the credit bureau. Don't Try, don't get into the Bureau de Credito. Uh, your suppliers generally have the possibility, the option to put you in a Bureau de Credito if you don't, if you don't pay them. 
banks also, but banks are going to be completely overwhelmed with everything that's coming their way. We're already seeing uh, annou uh, announcements in the newspapers that banks are saying, uh, we will give you four months that you don't have to pay your personal loans. Uh, we will give you three months not to pay your mortgage that is due. Banks see this coming and banks are going to be very concerned, uh, especially with the larger clients. Uh, also from experience, and that's why I stress so much the importance of your suppliers. Suppliers are your partners. Banks, with all due respect, tend not to be in moments of, of crisis. And then the other side, you are selling products. Uh, what are you going to do with your clients? Well, more, than, more important than, than ever, know your customer. Uh, sharpen your own credit management and, and find out as much as you can about your clients' financial situation. Uh, which markets do they sell in? Uh, do you expect, if, they're, if they're, their clients are all in the hotel business, you may expect some difficulties uh, getting paid and therefore you should reconsider selling to those companies. In other words, the world has changed and your client may have very well changed as well over the last couple of weeks. So make sure you know who you're dealing with. Thomas, I think I, would, uh, I, think I used up my time. That's where I would uh, leave this story. Again, in Mexico, we're only at the beginning of this whole situation. I hope I am completely wrong. I think that would make me very happy and it would make all of you very happy. But given what's happening in the world and given our experience from 10 years ago with the, uh, with the influenza porcina, uh, I think we better prepare for an, a very ugly scenario. Thank you very much, uh, Carol, uh, for your presentation. Um, we have one question for you from, uh, from the audience, and that is, which industries may actually benefit from the crisis? Uh, would this be video conferencing sector, <laughs> delivery, or, for example, IT outsourcing? That's a very good question. Uh, Netflix. Netflix. <laughs> if, I, if I just see my own behavior, I think I've seen more Netflix in the last uh, eight days than I've seen in the last eight weeks. But uh, more, more the pharmaceutical sector, of course, is a very good one. Uh, anything that has to do with food is a good one. Supermarkets is a good one. Department stores is not. Uh, the, the, just, just use some common sense. As the, what products uh, are you going to buy if you see your, rev your income reduced by half? And which ones will you postpone? You may not buy that new car, so stay away from, from automotive. This may not be the right moment to buy a new super duper television, but you will continue to, to buy food. Uh, you will continue to buy medicines. So I think those are especially sectors that, uh, that, that, will, uh, that will benefit from this. Certain chemical sectors that, that make products for pharmaceutical sector. Uh, of course, companies that make components for the handheld that we use every day. Uh, are very interesting sectors. Soap makers are very interesting sectors. Just look around you and, and use some common sense and that'll get you far away. Just the, air, the, the areas that I think will be most affected in this one is, is of course everything that has to do with hotels and catering, restaurants, uh, entertainment, and not so much the online streaming, but more the, the, the big event organizers. Uh, soccer clubs, football clubs, retail stores, of course, airlines and everything that has to do with transportation and, and energy and fuel is, is an area that I would be also very careful with. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Caro, for your, for your presentation. Uh, before Great we, pleasure. Thank you very much. Before we move on to the, to the next um, presentation, I would like to remind you that you can uh, fill out your questions any questions you might have in the chat box, and we will uh, we'll communicate this to the to the um, presenters. The next presentation um, will be held by uh, Magida van der Swet, who is the general manager of commerce of uh, IPS Powerful People. And the topic uh, will be the influence of the oil uh, devaluation on the Mexican economy. Either can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Carl. I think it's a very clear picture. Uh, for me also, I will try to set a picture on what the oil devaluation is. Uh, I made a nice presentation in the weekend and I could do it all over again yesterday. So uh, yeah, let's see where we get. And uh, hopefully this will be the start of uh, the discussion that we will have the coming months. I agree with you also that, uh, yeah, hopefully it's the worst case scenario that we're presenting at the moment. And hopefully we are a lot more positive in a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, for those who are also in the introduction session to the trade mission, there's a little bit of things repeated. Uh, I will uh, uh, show you a couple of slides that I also sh showed a couple of weeks ago, but after that we'll go to the current situation. So. Who am I? I'm uh, Guido van der Zet. I'm the general manager of commerce for IPS Powerful People. Uh, I've been responsible for Mexico for seven years. And the last year I'm also responsible for uh, a global business development, which means I've been on the phone the last weeks also with other countries. For example, our office in Saudi Arabia where they just started a complete lockdown. People are not, there's a curfew there at three o'clock. You cannot go outside, which obviously affects the business. But let's focus today on uh, Mexico. Uh, we are basically a company that does uh, recruitment, permanent staffing, which is obviously also difficult to hire someone in your company if you're not allowed to go out and go to an interview uh, or go to an office. Uh, we do payroll solutions. Uh, there are some things happening there also, um, which maybe we can discuss another time. And we do crewing, where we have vessels, where we have crew on board. You can imagine that, for example, we have a vessel in Curaçao where it's not allowed to fly to anymore. Yeah, how can you do crew changes there? Uh, we're looking at solutions there. If we can do anything there, we're more than willing to help. But today uh, we will talk about uh, Mexico and what the oil price has for influence on the economy. Uh, I'm also the co-founder at the time of the Dutch Energy Association, which is now part of Holland House, uh, which we're all listening to now. I don't think I need to further introduce since we're all here, we all found our way, right? Um, <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, today I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, the oil de devaluation, as I said. So I'll give you a state of the industry up to the 4th of March. That's when things started to change, the current situation and where we are today. And I'll give you my personal conclusion of what I think are the next steps, uh, which will probably change again in the next weeks, but then at least we know where we are. So also I see there's quite a few people from the Netherlands. So I'll give you a general idea of what the oil uh, industry in Mexico looks like. Uh, it has changed a lot over the last years. So I'll give you a very quick review. I'm sure you will not be able to follow everything, but the presentations will be shared. Uh, and also uh, I'll leave you my contact details if you have any specific questions. So let's start. The politic update. As you know, we have uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in the office since December, 2018. Uh, he made quite a few changes uh, in the energy realm. Uh, his first uh, objective is to get out corruption out of the country. He has a strong taste for nationalism, wants to reinforce Pemex. He's a big fan of direct assignations instead of tendering. Uh, and the energy reform who has been renamed to the new energy model. And current contracts are respected, uh, but uh, new bidding rounds are passed for the moment. Now, I will explain you the energy reform and what that is in a little bit as well in a couple of slides. So Pemex, Pemex actually changed even their slogan. They are now called Pemex por el rescate de la soberanía, which means to rescue the national sovereignty, which actually means that they would like to be self-sufficient in the end. Uh, we will see that uh, if we look at the numbers uh, of oil that's being exported and the, non and the gasoline that's coming in, uh, that has a negative trade balance at the moment, which is only becoming worse which I will get back in the next slides. The government investments in Pemex, uh, yeah, there are quite big amounts. For this year, there's 4 billion euros uh, planned to be invested in Pemex. The fields that uh, you see in the screen now, uh, and I repeat, maybe you cannot see them very well, uh, but you can definitely see them once we send the presentation, are the fields that will have the focus this year. As I mentioned, this uh, is an update up to the 4th of March. What happens after this, we will see. Uh, obviously, one of the plans is also to make a new refinery. Uh, here you see which fields there are, and on the right side you see where they are based. 
Dos Bocas refinery is also obviously one of the big uh, projects of the new uh, government, which I will talk to on the next slide talk to, uh, about. Uh, the refinery in Dos Bocas was announced in December 2018. It was already in the campaign and uh, as soon as he won, he started it. This is what it will look like more or less. Uh, it kicked off already in June 2019, the construction. The completion is still planned for 2022 uh, and it will have a capacity for 340 uh, million barrels per day, of which 170 uh, million barrels will be for gasoline, 120 million for diesel and 50 million for jet fuel, asphalt, and other means. Uh, the awarded companies here uh, are Van Oort, who is doing the groundwork together with Grupo Huerta Madre. Uh, they're about to finish uh, in these months, and then the next packages will come in. Uh, it's a modular um, refinery, which means that uh, it has five different packages of construction before it's finished, and the packages were all uh, one through tendering by different companies. So Floor Enterprises and Floor and Ecofloor will do package one. Samsung Engineering uh, Asociados Concepciones DBNR uh, will do packages two and three. And then KBR and Grupo Hostoti Paquillo will do the packages four and five. The total investment is estimated at 8 billion USD. Um, and here you see a little bit why. The average oil uh, trade balance uh, is declining. It's going negative, and this is uh, still declining steeply. If you look at the vehicle count uh, that's being estimated for Mexico, we are around 40 million at the moment, and we will are estimated to go to 90 million. Obviously, a big part of this will also be uh, different uh, fuels, uh, electrical cars, but that movement is still in the kid's shoes, as we say in Holland. Uh, it still has to start and come up. So a big part will still be gasoline. Now the other refineries, uh, Salamanca, Francisco Madera, uh, Miguel Hidalgo de Tula, and Antonio de Valle, you can see where they are here, uh, will also get upgrades and expansions in order to decrease uh, the reliance on US imported fuel on the graph. Below, you can see uh, what the gasoline production uh, has been, which are the, the blue graphs, and the imported is the dotted lines. So there's quite a big gap here. Uh, on diesel, it's the same in the orange. And diesel, uh, the situation is not so bad, but it's becoming worse as well. Now, as I said, it's not called the energy reform anymore. It's called the new energy model. This basically meant that the uh, oil and gas market was opened to uh, international companies coming into the yeah sorry coming into Mexico and actually a bid on uh, geographical blocks, which you can see here on the picture on the left. Uh, these were done by bidding rounds, where you can bid on the uh, on, a, on a certain geographical area. These areas, you can compare them, for example, with what they've also done in the US. Only these blocks are as more or less 80 times bigger than what they are uh, doing in the US. Uh, it started in August 2014, and 111 contracts have been given out, of which 107 exploration and production contracts, three farm outs, uh, and one under the new administration. Uh, there was a five-year plan uh, for uh, doing these bids on the different blocks. But this was canceled uh, last year, so we only got to about 25% of the original five-year plan. The envisaged uh, investments have been 3.4 billion uh, for deep water projects, 26 billion for shallow water, and 6 billion for onshore projects. And the companies that I will uh, allude to a bit more on the next page are 24 based on shallow waters, 15 in deep water, and 28 on land. These are the companies. Again, this is even smaller, <laughs> but here you can see for each of the blocks that you saw on the other page with the colors, which company has won which uh, field. Um, it are companies from 20 countries worldwide, and it's led more or less to the 170 awarded contracts that I mentioned before. Uh, <clears throat> and the estimated investment in total should be 160 billion US dollars in Mexico all foreign investment. I 
except for the national companies, which is a bit. So the income for the state, uh, and as I said, this is my last slide on the energy reform. Uh, uh, from 2015 to 2019, already 6.9 uh, trillion human uh, Mexican pesos were made. 3.7 trillion are expected this year. In the next period, uh, which is within still the uh, presidential uh, term, we expect another 18 trillion uh, Mexican pesos. Um, on the right side, you can see a graph with what the percentages are that go to the government from each of the blocks. So 1.1 is round 1.1. 1 .1. uh, how much is made there? So between 74% and 83. And you can see all the other ones. Here are the two farmhouses that were at the time that this sheet was made by Amexi uh, during their event in 2018. And also, um, what you see, these are the wells that are approved by CNH. There are still more uh, to be approved. But well, 11 wells have been approved for this year, which are two on land, six in shallow waters, two in deep water, and one in ultra deep water. Now, I remember very well, I did this presentation uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think it was the beginning of February in Holland, and everything was looking quite all right. There was only a small virus in China, but yeah. A couple of things changed. So now I go to the current situation and where this will go. First, obviously, there was the virus, the COVID-19, which obviously does not uh, help. Uh, we see the global economy going down. In Carol's presentation, he mentioned a decline of GDP of 2 to 4%, while a growth of 2.5% were estimated. In Mexico, we were already starting a recession and no growth is expected, so we have to see where we go. Obviously, the price war that you also mentioned between Saudi Arabia and Russia and the US who's mingling in as well, uh, made a decline in the oil price. Uh, this is the Mexican basket. I will come back on the brand oil, which is basically the uh, international uh, standard for oil. And then obviously this week, uh, we also had a vote against a US brewery. Uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned that, but that also made the investment climate a lot more difficult. Uh, I will not go too much into detail about this because that's more for a different discussion. I will go more into the one in the middle about the oil prices. But these three uh, are actually things that have been happening over the last week and we will only see the consequences in the coming weeks and months and hopefully it stays there. So if we look at the devaluation of the peso, uh, when I last did the presentation, the peso was, this is against euros, so don't uh, be shocked that this is dollars because that uh, is not at this level yet. But yesterday, uh, the euro uh, was worth 26.77 uh, pesos. Now, uh, Carol also mentioned what kind of influence this can have on economies, especially if you're importing. Uh, that's very difficult times if you're paying it in Mexican pesos. It's the worst performer out of 130 currencies, followed by Bloomberg over the last months. The reasons that I just mentioned, uh, the corona, the plunge in the oil price, and the investment climate with the decline and the closing of the, uh, the beer uh, manufacturer that was going to open in Jalisco, but that was voted against and now turned down, although it was already two-thirds ready for operations. Now, all of this together uh, brings us uh, to the following situation. We have uh, let's see what I'm doing here. Uh, the oil price. So Brent crude, which is basically the, the, the crude that is the standard for the world, was at 55.77, the 24th of February. That's just one month ago. Yesterday, it closed at 29.74. That's a decline of 47%. The Mexican basket was at 46.41 the 24th of February, and is now at 15.33. That's a decline of almost 70%. We are lucky that uh, the Mexican uh, government closed the hedge fund uh, for their production of 2020 at $49 per barrel. This means there's sort of an insurance on your selling price of crude, but the amount of barrel was not disclosed, although I, hardly, I doubt that it will increase uh, soon. Uh, and Obviously, if the situation goes on longer, we don't know what's happening after 2020. 
the IOCs are already taking actions. Uh, for example, Shell already announced that they will do 20% less investment and they have already postponed their uh, buyback of their shares. Same for Total, 5 billion investment less and Equinor as well. They will also postpone their share buyback. And Chevron also announced yesterday that they will invest 4 billion less. Murphy, one of the operators in Mexico, also already is taking action. The problem here is these are global numbers, but uh, we have to see what effect this will have on Mexico. Now, if we look here, we see the world production of oil over the last years. Usually the consumption and the production are quite near each other. Although you see oil prices uh, change if the consumption is lower than the production, of course. We already saw a decline in the beginning of this year, which also led to the idea of OPEC to, uh, to lower the production, which was declined. And now we are in the price war, which made it even worse. The fact that most people are now at home office, are not allowed to travel, planes are on the ground, uh, people are not driving, export, import, uh, and also transport is going down. It's taken a big jump. So there's uh, an oversupply uh, of at least 20%. So some of the analysts, uh, I'm not a macroeconomist, uh, are saying it might go down even to 25%. This means that there will be more pressure on the oil price and the production does have to come down. The problem is these are all uh, developments that have been happening over the last days. Uh, so the big question is, where are we going? Uh, and that's also something that doesn't help the consumer uh, confidence. Nobody knows. Uncertainty is probably the biggest enemy of the economy. Uh, so we have to see where we're going. That's also why uh, on this side, this is all we can say about it today. We have to see in a couple of weeks how the uh, virus is uh, developing and how the economy will react to it. Now, if we look at the Mexican economy and the state budget, uh, the total budget is a bit over 6 trillion Mexico pesos, of which a big part of the income, more than 50%, obviously comes from the taxes. In this part, you will also see the income that comes out of the uh, oil and gas rounds. So the IOCs that are now operating in Mexico and the percentages that I showed you earlier, that's going to the uh, petroleum fund which comes into the taxes uh, part of the uh, budget. Pemex itself with its production is on this side, uh, which is the income for sales of goods, services, and any other income. On the other side, the investments, for example, in the uh, refinery are on this side. Um, as Karel also mentioned, we have not seen uh, that big of an influence yet on the economy. But there are two things that will change this. And again, uh, I don't know where this is going, but we have to see in the next weeks. A couple of things that will happen is obviously uh, the employment rate. As Caro also mentioned, and I think he was still a little bit careful uh, with 2 million Americans uh, being without a job. Uh, if uh, the US has a cold, then sometimes, uh, always, Mexico gets a pneumonia. And the US has a pneumonia now, so where are we going with this? So the total population in Mexico is around 126 million, of which the workforce is 60 million. There's an unemployment rate, uh, which in my opinion is very difficult to calculate with such a big informal workforce, uh, of 3.66%. Uh, the informal workforce is half the population. Now, remember, these are the people on the street that are selling food and they don't have, don't have any other income. As Caro also mentioned, these people don't have an income if people don't buy their products. So that's going to be uh, one of the things we're going to have to have a look at. The informal workforce income is 22.5% of the GDP, and the formal workforce income is about 77.5%. Now, out of this formal workforce, there are also other tricks uh, where people don't pay the 100% social security and that sort of tricks, but I will not go into that at the moment. Uh, we can do that in another moment. But if things will change there, we will see rapid movements on the income of the government as well. Uh, here you see the income from the Social Security, which is 374 billion Mexican pesos. That will obviously have a big impact as well on the income. And then we have to start cutting on the right side. 
on where we are spending the money. And another thing we haven't mentioned yet, and which is obviously also not in the budget, is the investment in the public health. Because we are now in a very serious uh, health situation. There's a very limited number of uh, intensive care beds. There's a very limited amount of resources, especially for those people in the informal workforce, where they have to go if they become sick. So the entidad is sujetos a control presupuestario, the entities under budget of which the IMSS, the Social Security is one, they will need a very big investment in the coming weeks or even months. So these are the things that I think in the upcoming webinars we can have a chat and follow this very clearly. You can find all of this information on the diputados.gov.mx website. I also have a slide with all the sources that I'm using. So basically, we don't really know where we are going. But in my personal opinion, uh, and I'm also someone who has lived here for 14 years, I've seen that the Mexican people always help each other, they always find it out. We could see that the last time with the earthquake uh, only two years ago. People find a way. People are very uh, creative in finding solutions. However, this is a big scale of a problem. Now, in the end, we will overcome the COVID-19 crisis. We will find either a cure or people will have their immunity by having the disease. Uh, if this happens within one to three months, the damage could be repaired in a, such a way that the economy will boost. People are allowed to go outside again. They will travel. They will go out for food. They will spend some money, although some people will be a bit cautious. Uh, and the sooner, the better. So the less time it takes, then the closer we get to the three months, uh, obviously, the effects will be bigger. If this becomes three plus months, the situation will become more difficult. However, within those three months, we've already had a couple of other webinars discussing this. The other side, the oil prices will stabilize and eventually increase. In the end, the world population is still growing. In the end, the energy needs will still be growing. However, on the short base, uh, the predictions on Brent oil, uh, a couple of the big financial institutions such as Barclays, uh, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs are averaging at about a $30 uh, price for the barrel of the brand barrel that I showed you earlier. Uh, the IOCs with the measures that they are taking are preparing for a cost price of $20. Uh, our president mentioned this Tuesday in his uh, morning session that production average in Mexico is $12 uh, and he also, also has areas where it's $4 of cost price. Now I don't know what we should believe uh, of everything he says but that's up to you for yourself to uh, Decide. So once this starts happening, uh, Mexico needs to increase the production. We need foreign investment to do this. I think the reinstalling the bidding rounds where the government does not has, does not have to invest but will get a lot of money from this uh, is one of the most uh, healthy ways to do this. Obviously, uh, there's a couple of steps that have to be taken before the bidding rounds are back. Pemex has to be restructured. It's, it's currently the company with the biggest oil debt in the world. There's over 100 billion US dollars in debt and it is already uh, reporting record losses still. We have to see what happens there in the coming years. It's already under restructuring and it's one of the priorities of the current government, what we have to see. Then the 111 contracts that I showed you earlier need to deliver. The, presentation of Amexi of last year mentioned that they will be at a production of 280,000 barrels by 2024. Now, if these numbers add up, then there's no reason why not to come back to the uh, bidding rounds. So if we would reinstall the bidding round, it would lead to an increase of national income without investment. And as I mentioned, between 66 and 93% of the income goes to the government anyway. And it will lead to a job creation of over 300,000 jobs. Uh, if also the remaining 75 of the rounds would be held successfully. That's where I hope we are in a couple of months. But then again, this is speculation in my personal opinion. But that's the way in the oil where we should go in Mexico. And for the time being, I would recommend you to stay healthy and safe. But also be creative. For example, Shell at his uh, gasoline station is now giving antibacterial gel if you get your gasoline there. These kind of things are, you know, the way the economy moves. And I think that in the end we will get there. 
Uh, and I wish you all the best in the coming months. And I'm sure we'll see each other again soon in uh, these kind of sessions in the webinars. So that's all from my side. On the last slide, I only have the, uh, here's my contact details if you have any questions. Um, and here also on the last slide, you'll find the sources. As also Carol mentioned with his slide, uh, these are old news from the last days. And this list is adding and adding. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you very much Guido, for your presentation. We have quite a few questions for you. I think we have about time to, uh, to handle two. We'll start with the first one. The slump in oil and gas prices means it will not be viable for shale producers in, in the USA uh, and they will cut production. As Mexico import a lot of gas, what effect will this have on gas supply in Mexico? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I would have to get back on that. Uh, to be honest, uh, yeah, a lot of this gas is being won by the shale gas, and that is being uh, there are discussions about it. It's not viable because the cost is higher than the, the benefit. But I think uh, we will know a lot more in the next weeks. Uh, so far, there's a lot of speculation of the stopping of the shale, but it's not happened yet. Uh, to be honest, we have to see. I, I don't have an answer to that. Time will tell us, indeed. Um, the next question. If, uh, if OPEC, uh, which is Saudi Arabia and Russia, come to an agreement to reduce production, in your opinion, how great an impact will this have on stabilizing the global oil price? Uh, it depends to what they get. Also, I've seen that uh, yesterday uh, the high position from the US government is flying to Saudi to see if they can get to an agreement. Uh, still, if we go back to the graph that I showed you earlier with the demand and, uh, and production, we have to see that those two lines uh, get closer to each other. Uh, and we also are uh, very um, depending on what's happening in the economy. If the situation is here for more than uh, three months uh, and planes are on the ground, I mean, the state help will end one day uh, and then we will be in a very different situation. If we get to an agreement tomorrow, you will see that the oil price will stabilize, which is something that everybody expects, but it will probably stay around 30 and people and companies will need to make sure that we will be uh, at the 20%, $20 max cost uh, for production, that there's still a bit of room uh, to, to have some earnings. But on the longer run, we have to see what the demand does. That's the most important thing. In the end, uh, Russia already mentioned this week, it's not feasible for them to keep this up for a very long time. So I think we will get to an agreement and then we have to see what the effects are. Okay, thank you, Guido. Uh, I think we have time to squeeze in one more, uh, one more question um, related directly to Mexico. What is your personal opinion about the south of Mexico? Uh, do you think that Dutch companies can invest in, the, in alternative and clean energy resources such as solar uh, energy? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think the south of Mexico, as our president mentioned, is uh, one of the regions where most uh, investment will go to in the next years. I think for solar energy, it will be better to invest in, uh, in the north and in the western states of Mexico than in the south. Um, but yeah, definitely this is the time. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, geographical um, benefit. Um, Mexico is one of the best places for solar energy. That being said, uh, we have to see where the energy uh, need and demand will go to. And we also need to see what the rules will be on the new rounds on the solar energy. But on the whole um, renewable side, I think you just wrote a good report, uh, Thomas. I'm not sure if you're allowed to share that as well. And if it already changed a little bit uh, with this course of events. I think we can uh, we can share that also uh, to the person in question and maybe to to all of the uh, the participants in this webinar. And do you have any comments on this question particularly? I would say, yeah, in distributed generation there are um, opportunities for for Dutch companies um, and very specific in uh, in these markets in 
yeah, in, in solar um, and wind energy onshore. Good. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kilo, for, uh, for your presentation and for sharing your, uh, your opinion. We will move on to the, to the next presentation, the last presentation of this uh, webinar, uh, which, will be, um, which will be held by Jeroen Posma, who's the director of uh, Mexico Business Publishing. And his topic will be um, how the China-US trade war creates opportunities for Mexico. Let me see if Jeroen is with us now. Jeroen, can you can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. I can ah perfect. Okay. Because it was ah perfect. Very good. Well, I hope you're all going to be able to hear me well. Um, I'm in Spain in lockdown and everyone was on the internet, so the connection is not great at all times. Um, well, I get to tell a somewhat different story from, uh, from the previous presentations, uh, looking at the future, at what is happening uh, in the bigger picture in the world right now. Um, but before that, what I'm interested in at the moment when I speak with other people is what are they doing to, to uh, deal with coronavirus? So I'll take one or two minutes to explain to you about what we're doing, because I think that's, that's always interesting to hear. So uh, we run a couple of different businesses, a publishing business, uh, an events business, and a communication agency. Well, obviously our events business is shut down for unforeseeable future. There will not be any events taking place in Mexico for at least four months, we're estimating, and who knows, there could be more. Um, and the publishing business, well, this is not the best moment to try to do anything with physical uh, publications. So we are shifting from having five people working on a digital content platform to having 50. Just to give you an idea of what survival strategies can look like. If we do it right, it will work very well. If we do it wrong, well, it could be a tough ride. So just to, to give you a little insight on, on, on what coronavirus means uh, in real life for entrepreneurs in Mexico. Well, then the bigger picture is, uh, is the opportunities for Mexico in the world. And Mexico, of course, has already become to a certain degree a manufacturing powerhouse, but it's facing a rather unique opportunity at a, at a very difficult time. So in the end, what, uh, what typically happens when there is a crisis, there is also a lot of opportunity and the crisis is not just uh, coronavirus, the crisis is also all the uncertainty that Donald Trump has brought to global trade. And uh, well, the US-China trade war, of course, is the most important example of what has been happening uh, as a result of Donald Trump's uh, America first policies. And as a result of this, over only two years, China has moved down from being the number one trade partner of the US to being the number three trade partner. And who has emerged in the number one position last year is Mexico. So Mexico took over uh, from China and also has Canada below it. What happened with U.S. Uh, imports of Chinese goods last year? They went down from 300, uh, 539 billion dollars to 452, and also U.S. exports to China dropped. That was not exactly what Donald Trump had anticipated. Thomas, can you put the slide where we have this uh, this trade uh, this trade information? Absolutely. Yeah. So pretty much what we see is not so much that uh, U.S. trade with the world has gone up, but that China suffered from this trade war and that Mexico uh, relatively uh, did better. What you see here, the green bars are the U.S. imports in 2019. The yellow bars are the U.S. exports in 2019. So <laughs> we have some kids walking in here. Um, so if you look at those numbers, you see the huge trade balance that still exists uh, between the United States and China. This trade balance was much worse the year before. 
So if we look at, uh, at the situation, uh, the purple bar and the brownish bar, those are the years 2019 and 2018, and you see there below the, the, the trade deficits. So yes, Donald Trump did a good job in closing part of his trade deficit with China, but there is a very long way to go. Um, who's benefiting from this? Well, Mexico. Mexico has not, uh, this is only the, the first stages of this process, um, but we're in a place where Mexico right now can take advantage of the fact that many companies around the world are rethinking their global supply chain. And if we look at what happened in the last two years, uh, we've already seen a dramatic change in investment behavior. If we look at the last decade, the first six years of the decade, there was a huge amount of investment from the United States and the European Union into China. In between 2016 and 2018, it's already started to slow down. And now, uh, over the past two years, well, companies are definitely thinking twice before investing in a company like China. Uh, coronavirus is, of course, uh, not making that uh, drive to diversify your supply chain any less as the whole world is yet to see the real impact that, uh, that the dependence on China in, in global supply chains is going to have in the coming uh, weeks, months, and perhaps years. So what does that mean for Mexico and why is there an opportunity? Well, uh, as companies are looking to reduce their supply chain dependence on China, uh, Mexico can capture that share because it ha has a lot of natural advantages and a couple of coronavirus advantages now as well. Uh, and some, uh, some analysis firms believe that actually just capturing part of the foreign direct investment that is expected to be redirected from China to the rest of the world could add 2% to Mexico's GDP growth every year for the next decade. And uh, the good thing, uh, what well, this also is because there is always a, a multiplier effect when you receive manufacturing investment. For every dollar of investment you attract, you're going to receive about $3.6 in GDP growth. So what puts Mexico in this unique position? And well, this is a unique position that Mexico finds itself in not at all because of anything that the Mexican government has done right in the last years. Uh, a lot of this is just natural uh, advantages that the country has. So, uh, of course, first of all, Mexico has a very favorable location. You're next to the world's greatest market, access to the Atlantic and the Pacific, and that means you can trade not only with the US, but also with Asia and with Europe. And uh, Mexico can do that relative to China, if we talk about exporting to the US, at an 80% time advantage and a 75% cost advantage. So, for anyone who wants to shorten uh, the, the timelines in their supply chains, this is very attractive. For anyone who wants to sell into the United States, this is very attractive. For anyone who's looking for a manufacturing hub that can serve both the Americas, Asia, and Europe, this is probably the best place in the world to do that. And secondly, uh, labor costs. Labor costs were the reason why manufacturing moved to China initially. And uh, only a decade ago, Labor in China was six times cheaper than labor in Mexico. Right now, if we take into account all the costs that are associated with labor, uh, then labor in Mexico now is cheaper than labor in China. Labor in Mexico, including all the associated costs, comes in at $3.95 per hour. These are dollars at the beginning of the year, so imagine. Um, this number probably has gone down. Well, China is at $4.5 per hour. Then the third important fact is that Mexico is the eighth largest country in the world in terms of graduating engineers. This is often underestimated. People think that Mexico is a low-tech manufacturing hub, but very quickly already it's becoming a high-tech manufacturing hub. Uh, maybe in the beginning of the past decade, we were talking about this happening one day in the future, but that the future is here right now and also R&D activities picking up uh, a lot in Mexico. If you look, at Querétaro, for example, that is becoming already, I shouldn't even say becoming, that is today uh, an R&D hub for some of the largest manufacturers uh, in automotive and aerospace uh, industry. Then if we look at, uh, at the currency, well, the drop of the peso from 18, 19 uh, pesos to the dollar to 25 
means that Mexico's cost competitiveness in manufacturing just went up by 30%, 35, maybe even 40, depending on where the peso will end up. And then um, there was another factor of uncertainty that has not helped Mexico in the last couple of years, but is now uh, largely resolved. It's, it's NAFTA, which had to be uh, replaced and renamed into USMCA. And that created a lot of uncertainty. Uh, it has had a profound impact on the automotive industry, which probably is the industry that most closely connects Mexico and, uh, and the United States. So, um, so the fact that USMCA is now uh, practically a done deal means that we have a lot more stability and a lot more investment certainty uh, for Mexico. And then finally, and this links a little bit to, the, to one of the questions that Guido got, there is the very affordable U.S. natural gas, and there is uh, very uh, abundant uh, resources of uh, sources of renewable energy in Mexico. This means that also you have an energy cost advantage nowadays when you manufacture in Mexico. And um, I believe that there will always be enough supply of natural gas from the United States. Gas prices right now are at such a ridiculous low that um, if they would double, there would be demand. Mexico needs this gas at twice the price of this gas. This is still very cost competitive. So uh, this in the end is a, is a strong competitive advantage for Mexico as a country. And um, what does that translate into? Uh, an investment opportunity in manufacturing industries. And this is nothing new for Mexico. This is something that Mexico has many, many years. If we go back to the so the first investments in your automotive industry, we're talking about 70 years of experience in, uh, in helping global manufacturing companies to be successful from a Mexican base. And just to give you some examples of, of where Mexico already finds itself today, uh, Mexico is the sixth largest uh, car manufacturer in the world. And it's not only manufacturing cars of the past, if we can say, it's yeah. also manufacturing uh, this year, uh, nine electric vehicle models. So country is in that transition Not to say that all the supply chain is fully prepared for the transition but uh, the country is working on that also the top 20 vehicle brands have manufacturing facilities in mexico uh, and also very importantly is the fifth largest auto parts manufacturer in the world so if we look at, well uh, below you already see the the overview of the top mexican imports uh, from the us and the top exports to the us you look at these charts you see a lot of uh, a lot of products that are extremely related you see that oil goes to the united states and comes back as gasoline you see auto parts and vehicles and tractors moving in both ways you see uh, electronics mexico is the sixth largest uh, electronics and technology manufacturer in the world what you see in this uh, in these tables is those products moving back and forth between those countries the same applies to aerospace, where Mexico is the 12th largest aerospace manufacturer in the world, which doesn't sound that impressive, but Mexico is the third largest recipient of uh, foreign direct investment for aerospace in the world. And that industry has grown at 14% every year for the last 10 years. So these are all, uh, all, all not even, they're facts that show that Mexico is ready uh, to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, and this discussion is now becoming more apparent because, of course, over the last three months, a lot of people have wondered what is the future of manufacturing in China um, if supply chains get disrupted there. The chaos is unimaginable and we're just at the beginning of, of, uh, of living that. And another question that is starting to be asked is, will Mexico be the next China, albeit smaller? it can function uh, or it can play a very similar role. We're already seeing that happening at the moment uh, where, for example, uh, Japanese car manufacturers in the last weeks have started shifting production from their plants in, uh, in China to their plants in Mexico. And also uh, Chinese companies over the past 12 months have significantly increased their investment in Mexico. So we're not just talking about US or European companies uh, investing in Mexico rather than in China. We're talking about Chinese companies investing in Mexico because that makes sense 
from a global manufacturing point of view to serve their key markets. So if the Chinese are doing it, then we might as well copy it. So in, in conclusion, there is, there's a unique opportunity for Mexico. It will pretty much come after we have dealt with coronavirus, of course. Um, but if, man, if Mexico has the willingness and if Mexico's politics allow the country to be ready to take advantage of this opportunity, then uh, there is something very special that can happen over the next 10 years. So this is, uh, it's out there. Now it's up to, to Mexico and the business community to make that happen. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed these words of a bit more optimism in times of crisis. Thank you, you don't definitely um, a positive, uh, positive note during, uh, during these times of crisis. Uh, we have a question here for you. Um, mm -hmm. I quote, I don't get it that you say the lower value of the peso helps Mexican economy since most basic products like machinery are imported. Sorry, I, did, I didn't hear you so well. So the, uh, the question is, is why does the lower value of the peso help, Mexican, help the Mexican economy um, since most basic products like machinery are imported? In the end, when we look at manufacturing, uh, manufacturing industries, what happens is that uh, many of these, well, if you take a car, some parts move back and forth across the border up to 20 times. So there is a lot of partial manufacturing happening in both countries until you have a complete vehicle. Um, but in the end, uh, these products are largely export products. So if uh, all of your local cost will go down if the peso goes down, uh, of course, your dollarized items will cost the same in dollars. And if your final consumer is in a dollar market, which typically is the case of a Mexican product, then uh, the peso going down uh, is an advantage for these manufacturing companies. So if different components that go into a vehicle are priced in dollars, uh, but are later also going back to the United States market, in the final product, but in the process, all the Mexican inputs that have been put into that process that involve a lot of costs that are in pesos, then Mexico well, Mexico's cost competitiveness benefits uh, from a lower peso. This is in the end also why throughout history, countries have played with their currencies uh, and why Donald Trump has always accused China of being a currency manipulator. Uh, artificially keeping the value of its currency down, having your currency, uh, having a, a lower value for your currency means that you are uh, more able to, uh, to export. It makes it more difficult to import, but if those imports are just uh, components that go into an exportable product, then that will not affect you. Okay, thank you, Jeroen. Uh, we had one more question that actually was addressed to uh, to Caro, but Caro had to uh, had to leave this meeting for another meeting. Uh, so perhaps you can um, shine your mm -hmm. light. Uh, which industries um, or types of companies will recover most quickly? That depends a little bit on how long the crisis will last and how badly they're hurt. Um, because once the crisis is over, the ones that are bad, the worst affected will be recovering, uh, well, greater in percentage terms, but it depends how damaged they're going to be. So if you would say the crisis is over and everyone takes a plane again and books a hotel again, uh, well, then those industries should be back on their feet in no time, but it depends on what shape they are right now, what, what shape they will be at that point in time. But the ones that will, uh, will recover the fastest are the ones that will uh, be most negatively impacted now, but that will emerge stronger. So I doubt that you uh, can generalize for industries. If I would have to say now what will recover faster, I would talk about all the industries that are most affected, whether it's airlines or uh, hotels or logistics um, or oil for that matter. Um, all of those prices should recover very fast. Well, the oil as a commodity, its price should, for example, is would be a good example of uh, of something that should recover 
quickly as the global economy picks up again. Um, because in the end, the demand for oil is spread over a very large uh, number of, of consumers. When we, uh, when we look at airlines, for example, there will be airlines that bounce back very quickly. There will be airlines that have so much financial difficulty that they may have difficulty bouncing back. So, uh, yeah, as Carol was emphasizing a lot, it's the ones that manage their cash very well in these periods are the ones that will be able to bounce back quickly. If you manage your cash back badly, then you will not be ready to bounce back. If you have to, if you don't, well, to go back to Carol again as well, if you don't create a company that has value after this crisis, then you cannot bounce back. If you fire half your team, it's very difficult to bounce back. So the ability to recover depends on the industry you're in, but also on how you as a company have managed this crisis. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jeroen, for your comments. Um, I believe we have no other questions anymore. And with that, very good. We have come. Thank to you very much, Thomas. Thank you very much, Irun. <laughs> and with that, we have uh, we have come to the end of this um, this webinar today. And let me see if I can start my video as well. I would like to give uh, a short uh, recap of what was said uh, today, uh, in terms of uh, the current situation and measures taken in uh, in Mexico and the Netherlands. Um, currently, the Netherlands is. Uh, yeah, as a government fund um, to help companies uh, you know, pay out their salaries and, uh, for example, postponement of, of taxes. Um, in terms of export uh, between the lens of Mexico, no extra measures are taken for now. In Mexico, there's uh, currently no, uh, no federal support, uh, but at state level, uh, yeah, support has been announced. Uh, the different support uh, packages has announced, have been announced. Um, in terms of um, minimizing financial risk, uh, there will be uh, there will be huge pressure on uh, on the Mexican economy, um, and government stimulus would be the quickest way to uh, to economy rec recovery. Uh, however, this is not an, an option. Uh, this this could not be an option, perhaps, uh, given Mexico's uh, current state of public uh, finances. Um, so, what what can we do to overcome um, and minimize these financial risks? Um, Cash management is very important, as well as uh, reducing expenses and, uh, and focusing on, uh, on export. Um, communication with suppliers is, is very important at uh, in times of crisis, as well as keeping your, uh, your credit uh, standard high and uh, knowing your customer. Uh, in terms of uh, the influence um, of the oil uh, evaluation on the Mexican economy, um, yeah, currently uh, Mexico is in a difficult investment climate um, due to uh, yeah, obviously the COVID-19 uh, outbreak and the plunge in oil prices. Um, currently Brent crude uh, is down 47%, uh, Mexican basket is down uh, 67%, and uh, this year's hedge fund has been closed at $49 per barrel. Um, at the same time, I IOCs are making investment cuts um, up to 5 billion, some, some IOCs do this. Um, yeah, and then the personal opinion uh, by Guido van der Zwet uh, is that we will overcome this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, oil prices uh, will stabilize and eventually will increase. Um, foreign investment uh, is needed to, uh, to increase production as well as restructuring uh, Femex, very important. And it is important to uh, reinstall bidding rounds. And in terms of uh, the U.S.-China trade war, what we have learned uh, in, this, in today's webinar is that uh, this this crisis is also uncertainty, uh, um, yeah, caused by the U.S. Uh, policy on on relationship with China, uh, which has to has led to uncertainty in global trade. But uh, Mexico is likely to benefit from this. Uh, benefit from this global supply chain uh, rethink, rethinking, uh, which, which proves to be a unique opportunity uh, for Mexico. Um, yeah, and this stems from, uh, from that Mexico has advantages uh, as a stable GDP growth uh, and favorable location uh, in the world. Um, yeah, furthermore, um, yeah, low labor costs 
uh, and um, yeah, unexpectedly also high-tech manufacturing, which is taking place in uh, Mexico currently. And there is uh, an abundant renewable energy resources present in Mexico. Um, at the same time, um, Mexico is favorably, uh, favorably positioned uh, because of its uh, cheap gas supply from uh, the United States. Um, and this all leads to, uh, to Mexico being able to play um, a similar role as China, perhaps, uh, in the future. Um, yeah, with that, we have also come to, to the end of this, uh, this webinar. Uh, we look forward to hearing your, your feedback on this particular webinar. And we are also very interest in, uh, interested in hearing from you um, what you would like to, uh, to see in future webinars. Uh, we will be organizing uh, yeah, various webinars uh, in, in the coming weeks and coming periods. So anything uh, you would like to share with us, uh, please, re please reach out to, uh, to Karen uh, or to me. Let me see if I can move this to the last slide. Um, yeah, we would like to thank all speakers and, and participants also for, uh, for the active participation today in this webinar. And uh, we look forward to the next session. Thank you very much.